environment. I am Dr. Yemc Akimbobola, co-founder and CEO of African Women in Media. And it's a pleasure to have with me today and this were Mati Kingpaka, um, a journalist from Ox Oxpeckers, um, Madeleine Ngunka, uh, editor and data journalist at Info Congo, Amrita Gupta, editor and content officer at Internews Earth Journalism Network, um, Demis, Demis Tariki, a journalist with the Ethiopian Broadcasting Corporation, and Caroline Shebet, a journalist with the Standard Media Group in Kenya. And from the United Nations Environmental Programme in Africa, we have Mohamed Atani, who's the head of communication and outreach um, at UNEP, and Mr. David Ombisi, who's the program officer and coordinator of the EMCN Secretariat at the UNEP. Welcome to all our speakers um, and to all of you um, for joining us today. Now, the format for this panel is as follows. We'll start with an introduction of the partnership between AWIM and UNEP and our planned joint projects. And following this brief introduction, um, I will invite Mr. Mohamed Atani to talk more about the Africa Green Stimulus Program and the work of UNEP in Africa. Our speakers will each be invited to give their presentations and after everybody has given their presentations, we'll then go into the much loved question and answer session. So please, as we're speaking, do drop your questions in the um, chat box. May I please ask everybody to keep their mics on mute and the cameras off, um, especially when you are not speaking. So please do drop all your questions, like I said, in the chat and I will ask them after we've heard from all our panelists. So for those of you who were not at the plenary sessions um, over the last three days, I announced that AWIM and UNEP were partnering on what we're calling the Africa Environmental Journalism Programme. And the programme will see us invite journalists to pitch stories related to environmental issues in relation to the Africa Green Stimulus Programme. And those journalists that we work with are commissioned to produce their stories will be given access access to training and we'll work with media partners to ensure that there's a wide reach to the stories that you produce and um, through this process. We are particularly interested in ensuring that the voices and needs of African women are not forgotten in the global discourse on the environmental issues that we face globally um, and on the continent. So here to tell us more about the Africa Green Stimulus Program and why UNEP and AWIM have formed this partnership, and which is a critical partnership, is Mr. Mohamed Atani and Mr. David Ombisi. Mohamed, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Yemisi. Just confirmed that you hear me. Good morning, colleagues. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I'm happy to join your network. And uh, my name is Mohamed Atani, as Dr. Yemisi mentioned in her introduction. I'm the head of communications and outreach at UNEP uh, Africa office. And um, I cover 54 um, countries in terms of communication and outreach. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, David Ombisi, who is the um, head of uh, secretariat of the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment. AMSEN, which is a very important platform, political platform made of 54 countries in the continent to discuss and, 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 and make decisions on um, uh, environmental uh, uh, issues uh, across the continent. So um, uh, my, my introduction will focus on this partnership and the areas um, of uh, focus, including the African Green Stimulus Program. I will just talk about it briefly, but my colleague, um, David Ombisi, will go into details on the uh, program. And then I will talk about the Af uh, UNEP uh, uh, medium term strategy and why it's very important also and should be a focus of our partnership and um, the uh, celebration of UNEP uh, at 50, UNEP uh, 50th anniversary. So um, the African Green Stimulus Program basically is a platform that was um, uh, decided um, and developed by the African Green Stimulus, uh, uh, sorry, by the African 
um, conference uh, on the environment, Amsterdam. And it's an African lead platform. It's not a project, it's not a collection of projects, but it's a platform for coordination to bring some cohesion um, into um, project initiatives and uh, programs that are being implemented in, in, in the continent. It focuses on 12 pillars that my colleague will explain, and it aims to support the continents to recover from the current uh, pandemic that is really uh, impacting on the uh, uh, the uh, negatively on the uh, on the continent when it comes to uh, social and uh, economic dimension unep medium term strategy is basically uh, the strategy for its for 22 to 25, uh, 20, 2022 to 2000, 2025, and it's uh, uh, it outlines how UNEP will strengthen the environmental dimension uh, of the uh, 23 uh, agenda and had, will support member states actually to to implement. Uh, their national strategies when it comes to the environmental dimension in the um, uh, 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. And it focuses on three pillars, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and pollution. And if you look at those three pillars are key, the key pillars that are actually um, key for sustainable development in our continent, in, in, in Africa. The, um, the, the, the agenda or the, the strategy is a transformative, uh, 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 sorry, uh, strategy. And it's very important to outline uh, and underline this, this, this word transformative because there are a lot of projects, a lot of programs that are being implemented in our continent to support um, uh, African member states and to support our communities to 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 implement their 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 sustainable development plans, but um, uh, few of them are transformative. And the, the, you will you will you will listen, uh, you will hear from 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 my colleague David that the African Green Stimulus Program is a transformative platform, is a transformative initiative because this is what we need really to move on key um, uh, sectors such as energy, um, agriculture, uh, pollution, waste management, and, and all those key areas that are, uh, are important uh, to the development of the continent. The last um, uh, aspect that will also be uh, subject to um, a topic for our collaboration is the celebration of uh, uh, 50 years of UNEP. As you may know, uh, UNEP uh, is uh, the only actually um, a program that is UN agency that is uh, uh, hosted in, in Africa, in, 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 in the South. And uh, commemorating 50 years of the organization is an opportunity actually to uh, uh, reflect on what has been achieved and where we are today with the environment and where we are heading and what we really want to achieve and what we really expect from uh, UNEP as a, a program of the United Nations to support uh, uh, Africa. Our collaboration and partnership, and I underline the, 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 the word partnership with media is important. It's key because we work with media uh, as a partner. Uh, to implement our agenda, to implement uh, our strategies in, in, in the continent. And we have been engaging with a number of networks, uh, but this network is, is specific, to, uh, simply because it's, it's, it's made of uh, 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 female journalists and women, African women, has been on the front line to support the implementation of our programs, to support actually uh, 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 the continent moving forward and, and, and facing and finding solutions to the environment challenges that are facing uh, our communities in, in, in the continent. Um, just for between bracket, I mean, women is at the center of sustainable development. I mean, if you look just at food um, uh, production, which is, it goes hand in hand with uh, um, social um, and political stability in the continent. 
Uh, women produce between 60 and 70 percent of food. So women is feeding, African women is feeding the continent. That, that's just one example that I can give here. When it comes to tree planting, when it comes actually even in, in, in the media sector. So we really want to partner with you and work with you on the implementation of our programs, our uh, project including um, you know, a number of projects that are um, uh, there, including you know, um, a project with, with, with media. So I'm happy to join this network and looking forward to your questions. So let me, uh, with your permission, um, Dr. Yamisi give the floor to my colleague, um, uh, David Ombisi to brief you uh, on the African Green Stimulus Program. Over to you, uh, David. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mohammed, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yamisi. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have, uh, but I'll try to be straight to the point and um, uh, as brief as possible. And then, of course, uh, we'll take up uh, questions later on. Um, as Mohammed has already introduced, um, of course, I'm uh, David Ombisi. I'm uh, uh, the head of the African Ministerial Conference on Environment Secretariat, which is based here. Uh, at UNEP Region Office for Africa in Nairobi. And um, we work together closely with all the African ministers uh, from the 54 countries in charge of environment to basically uh, coordinate and come up with policies that help in terms of addressing environmental challenges uh, in the continent. The African continent, uh, uh, of course, is suffering extensive, extensively from climate crises, uh, from biodiversity crisis, from pollution, and many other waste uh, 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 challenges. And these challenges are increasing uh, by the day. And of course, with the uh, coming in of COVID-19, this didn't help matters. Uh, and therefore, with all these challenges and the crisis of COVID, uh, the African continent uh, really uh, was affected in a big way. Now, the ministers of environment uh, coming together um, were wise and thought that we need to address uh, these challenges, take advantage of the crisis uh, brought about by COVID and see how do we then address some of the environmental challenges that have existed uh, over the period. And this is how the African Green uh, uh, Stimulus Program uh, came in. So in terms of, uh, and in the face of adversity, there are some very positive uh, uh, movements, we can say. Uh, an opportunity to change direction, an opportunity to change how we do things, an opportunity to change um, how we address things in the African continent. And this also gave uh, the African continent a chance to rebuild the economies in a more greener and more resilient way. And therefore, uh, they agreed that the Africa Green Stimulus uh, Program, which recognizes the severity of the impacts of the uh, COVID-19 on Africa, uh, which of course exposed and um, uh, you know, affected economic, uh, social and environmental challenges uh, across uh, the continent. And therefore the Africa Green Stimulus Program is a key uh, step in taking advantage of this opportunity in making sure that we reset uh, the way we do business uh, within the continent. And therefore, the African Green Stimulus Program is really a platform, as Mohammed said, that would enable countries and regions to be able to take bolder actions uh, through integrating environmental considerations uh, in their plans and programs. And this is at the country level and also at, at the regional level. As Mohammed said, this is N not really a new program. It's not new pro uh, projects that we, we, we are starting, uh, you know, we're not starting from scratch, but it's really a platform to uh, um, uh, increase coordination, increase coherence, and uh, be able to, you know, support the implementation of the existing uh, uh, programs and projects uh, on environment and sustainable development, while at the same time, uh, identify new areas that would require strategic uh, intervention. So basically through the implementation of the existing programs and projects, we will also be identifying areas that need uh, you know, scaling up and areas that have not been addressed previously that would require uh, to be addressed 
uh, uh, in this context. So the Africa Green Stimulus Program is intended to bring about a common and unifying continental response uh, by enhancing and forging cooperation and partnerships uh, between and among African governments, uh, non-state actors, civil society, intergovernmental organizations, the private sector, uh, basically in support of a comprehensive uh, green recovery for Africa. And as my colleague Mohamed already mentioned also, we are looking at broad areas of where we'll be supporting and working closely with member states, countries, and other partners uh, to be able to enhance the implementation of the already existing uh, uh, initiatives. And we are looking at this platform providing uh, an enabling environment where we have immediate uh, and urgent interventions, where we'll have short to medium uh, term interventions. And of course, uh, we're also looking at the long-term uh, transformative interventions uh, to really support the sustainable growth uh, of the continent. Now, um, the platform therefore gives opportunities for member states and partners to look at broad areas uh, related to environment and sustainable development. And this includes uh, issues related to uh, air quality, um, uh, addressing waste management and promoting the circular economy. Uh, we also have issues related to conservation of biodiversity and combating illegal wildlife trade. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, and, and uh, revitalizing biodiversity economy, uh, looking at combating land degradation, desertification and drought, uh, enhancing climate action, climate change as you all know, uh, is a major uh, issue for not only African continent, but uh, uh, the rest of the world as well. We'll be looking at encouraging countries to invest in the blue economy, look at our uh, rivers, the lakes and oceans, uh, scaling up uh, climate smart agriculture and ensuring food security within our countries, uh, supporting sustainable management of forests, uh, improving water conservation and use within the continent, investing in renewable energy, uh, developing smart cities and promoting green urbanization. And last but not least, e looking at issues related to information, communication and technology. As you all know, with the crisis of COVID, we were all uh, left to now start working online. And you know we've had all these challenges of internet connectivity uh, uh, within the continent. And as part of this Africa Green Stimulus Program, we'll be encouraging member states to invest in this so that uh, if there are issues to be addressed online and through technology, uh, we, we can then be able to do that as, as we move along. Now, um, in terms of uh, looking at, uh, what are we looking at in terms of some of the uh, benefits of uh, the, the, the Africa Green Stimulus Program and how does the media then come in to assist uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, creating awareness ab about this African green stimulus and encouraging African countries to be a part of this and other uh, stakeholders to be a part of this. One is that we need to tell our story as Africa. As I said at the beginning, a lot is happening within the continent. A lot is happening within our communities, a lot within uh, uh, our counties, within our countries, but we are not sharing these stories. We are not sharing some of these success stories as well as uh, you know one would have wanted and some of the lessons, the best lessons so that these are then scaled up within the, uh, the continent and other countries can also learn from other countries to be able to address some of the challenges that uh, uh, we are experiencing as a continent. And therefore, from our perspective, the media plays a critical role in terms of being able to assist as we move along the implementation of the Africa Green Stimulus Program to be able to tell our story, to be able to um, share some of the best practices uh, that will have been, you know, uh, adopted in some of the countries. As we speak now, and in terms of even responding to the Africa, uh, to the uh, COVID crisis, a number of countries are already investing uh, um, a lot into uh, um, 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 into initiatives that would uh, act as uh, uh, green recovery initiatives. Um, 
if I give an example, you know, um, uh, you find that, uh, for example, uh, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, um, Senegal, these are just examples of some of the countries that have already invested uh, um, since the uh, beginning of COVID-19. Nigeria, for example, uh, investment into renewable energy policy that will create a number of jobs uh, within the energy sector. Uh, Senegal is also uh, investing into rural infrastructure development program, uh, while Kenya is also devoting um, uh, resources in improving environment, water and sanitation facilities as part of the recovery uh, from the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, which of course also addresses uh, the environmental challenges. So uh, coming back to the issue of the media, then of course, um, the uh, the current crisis and through the implementation of the Africa Green Stimulus Program uh, presents governments with the challenges and opportunities and would like the media to partner with us to be able to share these um, you know uh, measures that governments are taking uh, in terms of environmental sustain sustainability and 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 well being. So ultimately, you know, the recovery is an opportunity to build back better. Uh, combining an emphasis on restoring growth, creating jobs, uh, while at the same time achieving environmental goals and objectives. And I think this is a critical role that the media can help in terms of uh, uh, sharing this information with our population. So I'd like to stop there uh, for the time being. Uh, there is a lot of information in terms of where we are uh, in, uh, with regard to the implementation of the African Green Stimulus. And uh, perhaps we can share that uh, information uh, via email or online, but uh, I'll be ready to take some questions in terms of clarification, uh, and I would like to stop there. Thank you, Yemisi. Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohamed Atani and um, David Ombisi for that information around the Africa Green Stimulus um, Program. And um, since you've been talking, we've had quite a few people join us, so I'm just going to, you know, reiterate again that with pleasure, AWIM and UNEP have partnered um, to support um, environmental journalists in Africa to report on environmental issues um, through our Africa Environmental Journalism Program. And through this program, we'll be working with a range of journalists. We'll be inviting you to pitch your stories around environmental issues affecting Africa, particularly those that speak to the gendered perspectives on the environment. And the journalists that we work with will have access to training as well as part of the program. So we're really pleased to have partnered with UNEP on this very, very critical um, topic of the environment. And as um, David and um, Mohammed said there, women are at the center of all of this and we produce um, much of food um, and food and agriculture on the continent and so our stories are really important and we must not get forgotten in media discourse around environmental issues in Africa. So thank you very much to UNEP, to Mohammed and David for their introduction. And now I would like to invite our first panelist, Amrita Gupta. Amrita will highlight the work of Internews and takeaways from their recent gender report, where they surveyed grantees to understand the pain points in the field um, and where they felt that they could have the most impact. So Amrita, over to you. Thank you so much, YMC. Um, it's really an honor to be invited to speak at this conference and also to be part of this accomplished panel. I was wondering if it would be possible to put up my slides. Yes, I'm just um, doing that right now. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, I know time is short, so I'll jump right in. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Earth Journalism Network, I thought I would briefly introduce what we do. Um, so Earth Journalism Network, or EJN, is a project of Internews, and um, our mission is to improve the quality and the quantity of environment and media, environmental media and climate coverage around the world. And um, we currently have over 14,000 journalists in our network, and we've trained uh, close to 13,000 journalists, and we've produced as many stories. 
So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, I'm Amrita, as uh, Yamsi introduced me. I'm the editor and content officer at EJN. I just wanted to jump into um, highlighting a little bit about EJN's recent work in Africa. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so here you'll see, so uh, the way that we do our work, um, our support may take the form of trainings. This might be uh, trainings to build capacity among journalists, um, capacity building of newsrooms. Uh, we give story grants, we do mentorship, and uh, we've set up geojournalism platforms. Some of these names might be familiar to you. Um, we've partnered with or helped set up um, you know, Info Congo, Info Nile, um, Wild Eye with Oxpeckers. And um, our most recent project is the East Africa Wildlife Journalism Project. And you'll find um, more information about all of these uh, in our, on our website. Um, Caroline, who's on this panel, uh, was a grantee of the East Africa Wildlife Journalism Project. Um, and, and really, I think the, the focus of our work here, you know, like in India, where I'm from, or in countries which are on the front lines, of the climate crisis, it's very important that the media coverage is sustained um, and, and has depth, not just when there's a disaster like a flood or a drought, but really driving attention to mitigation, resilience efforts, strategies and solutions um, that are coming from within these countries. So um, there's much more information on all of these things on our website. Um, I will quickly move now to highlighting our current opportunities. Um, if we could, yes, thank you. Um, so very similar to the program you just launched, which I was so excited to hear about. Um, we also have just recently launched a project um, to support coverage of green recovery um, efforts. Uh, this is a global project, but you are, you know, journalists who are tuned in today are welcome to apply for a story grant. Um, really, the, the, the impetus of this is that right now with governments pushing money into recovery and, and stimulus to stimulus, stimulate the economies, it's very critical for journalists to, to really monitor are these funds going towards, you know, building a more sustainable and equitable um, future, which is what we want to see. And um, there, we also have a recent webinar um, where journalists can learn a little bit more about the green recovery. Um, for many of us, you know, it was a new term, uh, just as COVID sort of introduced us to a whole lot of new terminology as well. Um, this other opportunity here um, closes today, but there's still a few more hours to apply. Uh, it's on uh, wildlife trafficking and other environmental crimes. Uh, it's focused on East Africa. Um, so yeah, uh, just again, encourage you to visit the website. Uh, if you sign up to our newsletter, you will be up to date about upcoming webinars, opportunities, things like that. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, if we could move now to the next slide, yes. So here, I really wanted to um, take a little bit of time to, to, to share um, about our work on advancing gender equality and, and social inclusion in the media, which is, you know, these are core values of Internews and EJN. Uh, we recently conducted this safety survey uh, with, uh, across grantees um, in nine countries in, in Africa. And um, you will see here that we, what we wanted to find out was essentially what risks are journalists facing in the field? How in, in what ways are those related to gender? And uh, how do journalists keep themselves safe? More importantly, how can media organizations and media you know, newsrooms help and ensure this, this safety um, of journalists and especially women journalists? Um, and you will see, you know, especially for environmental reporting, there are so many barriers that are gender related. Uh, and there are some, just a few examples here of the responses that we received. Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to share with you. Um, the next, thank you, Yancy, uh, is uh, the findings from a recent report that we actually um, are yet to launch, but I wanted to share a little bit about the findings and the recommendations. So essentially, um, this is called Where Are the Women? And it's insights from across Asia 
uh, on the barriers faced by women journalists on reporting in the field and also uh, on including women as sources. So this builds on Internews's work um, called Reflect Reality, which was really a study to, to amplify women's visibility in news media. And um, so what we did is we spoke with uh, journalists who received EJN support, and we really asked them to identify what they think about gender, the importance of having gender balance um, sources, who are not just, let's say, you know, affected communities or women who are, you know, something climate change is happening to, but also um, experts and, uh, you know, leaders in their field. So in what ways, you know, is that happening or not happening? And so you'll see here some of the key findings. I'm sure some of this, you know, this is not going to be surprising to too many of you, but it was, it is quite eye-opening to see it um, pulled out like that. And just to move on to now the key recommendations. Um, so these were recommendations on how newsrooms, editors, um, journalists, freelancers, or on staff can really try to achieve a better gender balance um, and more, bring more diversity into their stories. Um, this recommendations on training, on resources, on support that could enable them to do this. And, and these are really the key recommendations that we just a few of the key recommendations that we we found from from that report um, that I wanted to share with you. I know there's a lot of text on the slide, but I did want to grab as much as I could from that report. Um, you know, especially when it comes to um, as the previous speaker spoke, uh, uh, sustainability, uh, especially climate and environment, um, we cannot achieve sustainability without empowering women. And so, the media must really move forward in prioritizing women's voices. Uh, so, so this was very much to that end. What can we do? And I think that many organizations uh, will find will find these these suggestions useful. Moving now to impact, um, which is another key focus of EJN, especially in recent years, we've invested a lot of time and resources to really understand um, the. Um, you know, results of the support that we're providing to journalists and media outlets. Um, it's also one way to get more support for environmental media is to really show that it makes a difference on the ground. So it's how does it drive policy action? How does it drive, um, you know, change? And, and in what ways is, what, what, what are the barriers that sort of prevent it from doing so? Um, so here uh, we used this uh, methodology called um, an outcome harvesting approach, which you'll find more info on on our website. But briefly, I just wanted to share um, some of the findings that you know you're more likely to see actual change on the ground when stories are in local media outlets, in local languages. They are actually reaching the audiences that they are meant to. Um, they are, um, you know, both evidence driven, but also have a strong human interest angle. So these were some of the things that we found from this external evaluation. Um, and then the next slide really um, just showcases, you know, from Fiji to Yemen to the Solomon Islands to Odisha in India, some of the stories that we've supported um, and, and what kind of impact they've actually had. Uh, so it is heartening to see this, and this is something that we're going to be sort of really focusing on highlighting in, in the months and years to come. So just to quickly um, wrap up, because I know we have a long program ahead of us, I did want to share with you some resources um, that I think will be useful both for journalists and for, for organizations. So really, these are focused on, uh, you know, advancing women in leadership positions in newsrooms, um, women as sources in the news, and I would say um, the working conditions and the challenges faced by women journalists in the field, um, you know, which we're all too familiar with. And um, the, the flip side, women as the audience and as readers, because that is, you know, we need to do work to, to improve that as well. 
So yeah, I hope that you find these resources helpful just as a start. Um, please send us more as well. We're, we're very sort of open to adding more of these um, as we come across them. But we've found these really helpful and we share these with our um, story grantees when they start working on their projects. So yeah, um, that is it from me. And um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks. Over to you again. Thank you very much, um, Amrita, for that insightful um, presentation around the work of, um, um, sorry, Earth Journalism Network. My screen just yeah. froze. <laughs> <laughs> and thank right. you for sharing those slides as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And I'm pleased that one of the recommendations that you've made is around developing a database of expert sources, particularly for women. And I, during this um, conference, our women has actually launched our um, kind of um, African women expert platform called Source Her. So if you go to sourceher.africanwomeninmedia.com, you'll find a whole load of female African women experts in a vast, you know, a wide range of industries um, as well. So Joy is just going to put that link into the chat in a moment. Um, so thank you very much, Amrita, for that. So next we have Madeleine Ngonga. Madeleine will offer a regional perspective um, cover, of covering environmental news and share some innovative approaches to reporting the environment. So over to you, Madeleine. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today to, to this uh, conference. And I'm really honored to be among the speaker of this panel. I will quickly share, share my screen about uh, this presentation. So um, today um, I would like to focus on how to cover uh, news from a regional perspective and uh, the power of data and collaboration. So like uh, MCD just said, I'm a journalist working uh, for Info Congo in the Congo Basin region. So we are an online uh, regional platform that cover a uh, story and, uh, uh, related to the, to the ongoing change. It can be positive change or negative change that's happened in the Congo Basin. And uh, we have been supported and we are still supported by the inter Her Journalism Network, Inter News, like uh, Amrita just said. So it's a pleasure to be here and share the experience of what we have been done, so we, are, we, are, we did so far in terms of covering environmental news in the Congo Basin. So um, we, we all know that uh, the Congo Basin is uh, the second largest forest of the world after the Amazon. And this make uh, this region uh, really important in terms of biodiversity, but also in terms of communities living in those forests so we have uh, indigenous communities that used to that really depend on forest for their livelihood. We also have a lot of biodiversity resources or forest resources that our community depend on, and that are really important for our heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these uh, are suffering from climate change and other uh, environmental issues like illegal logging that really affect. Uh, not only the Congo Basin, but the entire world in terms of impacts of uh, climate change. So um, in this region, we are trying as uh, um, a regional platform to link countries in terms of um, their different um, challenges, because either you are in Cameroon, in DRC, in Gabon, in the Republic of Congo, or in uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, communities there. So we are here, we are in a tropical, uh, we, can, we are in, a, in a rainforest countries, but apart from countries within this rainforest country, uh, uh, rainforest region, we have neighboring countries that are really suffering from the same issue like us. Uh, we have a different issue or main challenge that are deforestation. Um, we have floods. In, uh, in some area in, in the sub-Saharan Africa in general. We also have coastal erosion and uh, endangered wildlife that uh, communities or uh, uh, environment 
uh, it's a real challenge for for us in this in this day. Also, we have waste management in in different cities, either in uh, Cameroon, in uh, Ivory Coast, in South Africa. So all those issues are connected between our countries. Our country, our countries are connected with all these challenges, all these problems. So how, as journalists? we are trying to, to report on this is to showing that it's not an isolated problem for Cameroon or for DRC. It's a whole problem that concerns or that impacts people from that con in that country, but also people from abroad. Or it can be problem that um, um, uh, the main person responsible of those problems will be people coming from other countries or even people living in that same in those same countries. So we try to link this way uh, the challenges from one countries uh, one country to another country. So um, in terms of approach, we are trying to combine uh, different ways of reporting. Now we we as a uh, uh, an online regional platform at it for Congo. We try to combine a field trip investigation, uh, online investigation research, like uh, uh, using Google to do some research, going on an open data platform to download some data set, uh, trying to use uh, satellite imagery analysis to get some insight about the, the location we are investigating on or about the change. Uh, it can be three covers in one particular area, or we can try to see how uh, we have coastal erosion, the, the progress of coastal erosion in particular cities using uh, those saturated imageries or those um, online tools that, available, that are available for journalists today. We also encourage collaboration between journalists sometimes we have colleagues in other countries uh, that are investigating a specific issue uh, that we can have in our own country. So we can be like fixer for those journalists coming from abroad to, to, to report uh, um, uh, in Congo Basin, or we can also collaborate with colleagues let's say I'm in Cameroon and I have colleague, uh, a female journalist colleague in Congo, uh, she would like to report on uh, 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 indigenous forest communities that are suffering maybe for, from illegal logging. And she would like to have the point of view from Cameroon side, like how Cameroonian indigenous community in Cameroon are affected by this problem, uh, trying to compare how these community are suffering like the one in Congo. Me as a Cam uh, Cameroonian journalist or journalist based in Cameroon, I will give insight from what we can have as information on field in Cameroon and adding, she will add to what she has as expertise or, or she has as information in Congo, in the Republic of Congo to build something strong that show uh, a problem from a regional perspective. So not just say, I'm in Congo, I report about Congo, but how taking in cons into consideration that I have colleagues in other countries, even if I cannot travel to that con to those country, I can contact my colleague uh, within our big network and have some information, even some pictures to build a strong, a strong report. So we try to build our report on collaboration. Uh, the collaboration is not just among the journalists. We are also trying to work with NGOs, NGOs in different countries. Uh, most of the NGOs have website. If you don't have direct contact with NGOs, uh, sometimes you can find some contact in their website. Uh, like for example, in this picture, you can see elephant. It was a story we published about um, elephants that were getting skinned because of climate change. And uh, it, the report starts from a research from scientists that have been published in a scientific review. And we use this as example to show how elephants in Gabon, so biodiversity in Gabon are suffering from climate change. People used to say that uh, we have just um, a criminal, criminal who attack elephant, but 
Now, scientists also prove that apart from criminal, we also have uh, uh, this climate change that really affects uh, elephant in Gabon. And the other picture is about uh, uh, satellite images of um, mining, how mining is uh, affecting tree cover loss in Cameroon, in East Cameroon. So we also uh, collaborate with NGO to get data about uh, the deaths uh, of communities due to uh, illegal logging, illegal mining activities. And we use all those information to build a strong report about this situation. Other stakeholders that are really important are community leaders. Uh, Sometimes you can have information within the report, NGO report or governmental review, but when you go on fair, it's always good to have uh, contact, to have a relation with indigenous, with communities leaders. Without this connection between the journalists and communities leaders, it will be difficult to get accurate information from the field when you go on field or sometime when you want to check or re quickly verify uh, in an, an information from the field. So these are the, 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 the different ways uh, in terms of collaboration, we, we try to, to manage to have uh, accurate stories in our website. So um, we cannot finish without um, uh, speaking about the space for women journalists. I'm a female journalist. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been working on uh, environmental issue for more than six years now. And I can, and I, I can assume you that in the beginning, it was not something really easy because uh, from gender stereotype, we used to say scientific subjects are uh, difficult to handle for women. So um, sometime when you go, when we try, when we try to enter on this field, we see most men uh, uh, like uh, male journalists who are there uh, writing stories. So when you come there, we say, okay, are you able to go on field? Are you able to travel to forest area to cover environmental issue? Are you able to travel to an Iceland to see how coastal erosion is affecting communities? Uh, these are some barriers that people think sometimes that women cannot achieve or women cannot deal with the, or can, cannot uh, over overcome to this obstacle. So uh, thanks to some training, uh, I learned also myself to know that it's not a topic for men, it's topic for journalists. We need to investigate those topics. And women journalists uh, are, are really, can really, um, um, can really bring something new in terms of uh, the voices, bringing the voices of other women in the, in this domain. So uh, we are trying now to have more space for sharing experience. Like for, for us at Info Congo, when we have uh, women journalists that are really uh, afraid of writing on this topic, we try to encourage them and uh, bringing them on trainings. When we have training, we try to have a balance, a gender balance participation like if you have five men, you we'll have five women also to make sure women, women will be there. And even after the training, we are trying to follow up with women. If a, a, a female journalist is writing about environmental issue and uh, she contact us, we will try to help her in terms of even and getting data if it's difficult for her or showing her or coaching her on how to analyze and make good uh, visualization for her for her reports. Also, we try to collaborate uh, in women's group to help other women to improve their way of uh, writing on environmental issues. And this also help us to have gender balanced stories. Like for example, this is a story about um, how uh, communities in the Cameroon in East Cameroon are suffering after uh, the Lompaga Dam has been uh, 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 having have been filled. So uh, we have fisher communities that are really suffering. And when we uh, went on field to report on this 
when we go on field to report on this type of issue, we make sure we will discuss with women how this uh, fisher women or women living in this fish in these fishing communities are impacted by uh, this flood or this uh, situation of the dam. So, like you, you can see in this slide. Uh, um, some women that have been interviewed said a small stream where, where the women often fish during the dry season are all swallowed up by the lake there in Wami. It's really like the sea. We don't know how to fish in, in the sea, lament Jacqueline Asunga. So we make sure that we give voice to women to express how these environmental challenges, how these environmental uh, issues are impacting their life because they are the most vulnerable people and as women journalists in, uh, um, involving in writing stories on environmental stories uh, i think we are the best place to have gender balanced stories and uh, to encourage our our other colleagues uh, that are not uh, that are male journalists to also have balanced story when they write about this issue and for this case this story has been written by a, a main colleague, but we try to guide him to make sure he will interview female when he will be on field. So uh, this, this is it for my presentation. And thank you very much. I'm open to any of your questions. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. You've given us so much to think about. And I'm going to ask everybody to drop their comments and questions in the chat so that we can come back to it at the end. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move strif um, swiftly on to the next speaker, who is um, Caroline Shebet. Um, and Caroline will be offering insights on the role of the media in reporting environmental issues and how environmental journalists can tap into the opportunities available to them. So over to you, Caroline. Hi, Caroline, you're on mute. If you just unmute your mic. Yeah. There you go. I and think that, that is okay. You, yes, it's fine. And would you like me to do your slides for you? Please do, thank you. All right, thank just, give, so me a, just give me a moment. Thank you again for, sure. And thank you again for, for having me in this very interactive session. Uh, this is one of the, this is one of the most interactive sessions I think I have uh, I have been in. Uh, mostly I will share about uh, the role of media in uh, environmental reporting. Mm. I'm just being, bringing up your slides. So it's here now. So just give me one yes. second, please. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, as it was said earlier, my name is Caroline Chebet. I write for the, I'm an environmental journalist with the Standard Group in Kenya. And I, uh, I am also a 2021 Development Reporting Award winner in the, in the print category. So we can start our presentation. The next slide. Uh, we are looking at the role of media in reporting environmental issues. Mostly, I think most of this, uh, these are very basic, is to raise awareness. Most of the, most of what we are currently facing in Africa are, uh, a lot is happening, especially re related to climate change. But how do we tell these people this is, is directly linked? I think uh, as journalists, we are, we are best placed create awareness, also to advocate for change and improve quality of planet through, uh, through our stories and also educating the public, public on uh, about the state of environment and what should be done. And also bring out the stories that can be, be replicated elsewhere. The story shared uh, there is a story talking about the, a very aggressive restoration plan currently taking place in Kenya's Tana Delta. Tana Delta is one of the largest uh, deltas in Kenya. 
And it, all over the years, it has been facing a lot of challenges and climate change. And uh, I think these are part of the green recovery efforts to, to bring back the Delta as it used to be. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Hello, on our next slide, uh, I, I, I will also share the stories that have inspired, inspired policy formulations here in Kenya. The stories below, the stories shared there are some of, uh, this was one of the story I pursued, that was in June. I think Amrita had talked about this story. This story was talking about uh, African gray parrots. African gray parrots uh, are usually in the, equatorial forest of West Africa through to the East Africa. But this bird, as, as much as this one of the big stories on, on uh, trafficking, on wildlife crimes, little is told about birds. And I thought this is one of the, my pitch was to really bring out the little told stories about uh, that is really impacting on global populations of this bird. This story talks about even how these birds are what being trafficked across the continents from West Africa into East Africa and across the world. And uh, this, this is uh, by June this year, the Kenya Wildlife Service gazetted, put a gazette notice notifying that uh, whoever has this African gray parrot will be now required to register with the government. This, this is one of the stories that brings the impact. It shows us how much impact it, it, there is in this story. This is a story that was really less talked about in Kenya. And uh, today, as we speak, this is the, the, Kenya, Kenya, the Kenyan government gave an amnesty of 45 days. That was from 25th of October this year. And uh, today was the last and uh, it was even in the newspapers today, I think, I don't know if you can see, that it is now illegal to own these birds in Kenya without being re without registering with, with the government. So that is one of the stories that talks about the impact of our work. You can move to the next slide. Now this is another interesting topic, topic on uh, sourcing environmental story ideas as environmental journalists. Where do we get these story ideas? I think my my colleagues had uh, earlier shared some of the some of the ideas, but uh, I'll briefly share where I sometimes get some of these ideas from science research websites and journals like the conversation the conversation I think it has very good, uh, uh, it is a platform where researchers and the scientists usually share their research, researches. Like this, the story shared there, it was on, uh, it was some research that was done in Botswana. But this is a story that it was talking about uh, com combating human wildlife conflicts especially in uh, area, especially between farmers and con conservancies. Scientists came up with a very nice approach and they published their research in Science Daily. I think it was Science Daily website. And uh, we did this, uh, the story that we, we, we made it local. You localize a story to, to give it, to, to break a lot of science in it and give it an interesting twist. You see the story, the, it, it was a very colorful picture on how they paint the behinds to scare away the, the lions. Also, these stories you can, you can source from in international influential bodies like the UNEP, the IUCN, traffic, the, and other organizations, the global, Initiative against transnational organizations they usually have very good, uh, very good scientific journals, very good 
very good write-ups on the same, and also from local and conservation organizations like the Africa Wildlife Fund, the Nature Kenya, the, all, all across, especially if you are looking for the regional stories, you, you target these organizations that uh, have, that are regional, these regional organizations, they usually have very good initiatives, especially currently when the, the continent is facing a lot of challenges with uh, related to climate change, they, are, they have a lot of initiatives and the ideas which you can localize so that even other, organ other countries can replicate. There are also conservationists and environmental activists. These are very key people. I remember there was a, recently there was a story I was pursuing and one of the community members was telling me that a hungry person cannot conserve. That was a very heavy statement that is, that, really holds, it really tells about what is really happening, that we need a lot of stories on sustainability, even from the ground. What are these people doing to sustainably conserve that can be even replicated in other areas that are facing the same conservation challenges? From government institutions, also, that is another source. They have very good information, and uh, I think we need to also tap in these government institutions uh, from environmental and conservation media outlets like Mongabe, they usually have very good researchers. Those are some of the environmental story idea where you can get an, an environmental story idea and localize it. We can move to the next slide. Reporting opportunities in wake of the pandemic I shared this IJNet, International Journalists Network, because uh, they usually share a lot of opportunities for journalists, especially cu currently where we know most of the newsrooms have challenges with funding and everything. So sometimes pitching us, you can have a story idea and pitching it is a bit difficult in terms of resources. So there, you, ca you can tap some of these opportunities through reporting grants from organizations like uh, Amrita had shared, like Internews, like even uh, there are a lot of opportunities, especially if you look at this, this uh, website, you will get a lot of these opportunities. They also, for women journalists, I think you should really tap on International Women in Media Foundation. They usually share a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities in highlighting different topics. As long as your pitch is really nice, I'm also a beneficiary of a, a grantee for International Women in Media Foundation. I was working on a story uh, on how the, the impact of uh, the impact of trade on donkeys on the local women in Kenya. I was looking. They usually fund a lot of stories with the gender perspective, and it is a very good platform for women journalists. Also through environmental conservation and development journalism fellowships, through fellows, joining fellowships also helps a lot because uh, you, can, they, you can easily partner with some of the, these organizations and uh, they can sometimes they help you access even with they help you with some of the resources to bring out these stories. Uh, we can move to our next slide. Reporting environmental issues with the gender lens. I think uh, it has been said majorly that women are more vulnerable to effects of climate change. However, their voices are least heard. I think this is because sometimes when you go to the field, in case of anything, you find most of the people who are willing to speak are um, mostly men. But how do we really bring a lot of more, more women voices? We have to identify those directly experiencing these challenges. And most of them are women. Say in cases of floods or drought, you find most of the women are left alone with their children. So I think it gives you 
bring out the picture. You bring out the picture with these voices of women and how they are really feeling it. Identify the conditions that make women more vulnerable, environmental issues. Bring them, bring the success stories women are doing to combat these challenges. Like uh, there was a story of a swing in the Tana Delta. As much as there's a lot of drought currently going on, I, I wanted to bring out the story on a different perspective on how women are handling this issue. And it was very interesting because many women were opening up on how they are now mainstreaming the climate smart agriculture initiatives in those areas. So you find more women are, are fast in adapting because they are mostly affected. Bring out the success stories of these women on how they're dealing with these challenges that other women across the continent can also adapt. Avoid generalizing the effects and impacts of environmental issues and let the, the stories have own life. And then also highlight initiatives women are undertaking to solve environmental challenges. I think I had given an example on that. We can move to the next slide so that we can see one. Another thing is developing a contact database. And as an environmental journalist, we are usually, sometimes we, we really want to pursue a story, but you really don't know how you can get these people. So one of the, the there's, a, there's, there's an approach I usually use in, get, in, in getting these people. You identify your useful contacts you come across, all the contacts you come across, like conservationist scientists, conservation organizations, all of them, pick their contacts and get essential information about those contacts and what they specialize in, their email addresses and their social media contacts. Choose where you will keep the media contacts, especially in the Google Sheets. Google Sheets gives you a... So in case you lose your phone, you lose your... your especially your phone, you always have the Google Sheet. You can always refer. You can save the... the, the your key contacts and your, their social media, their email and their mobile phone contacts. It is usually very useful. We can move to the next. Uh, I think uh, we are done. That is, the, that is my presentation. I'll also share some of the links to some of these stories that have had impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Caroline. That was really insightful. And thank you so much for those tips that you shared with us in the end. We're going to come back to questions at the end um, after we've heard from our last speaker, who is Andiswa. And she's going to tell us about her work in combating wildlife crime in Southern Africa using data journalism. Over to you, Andiswa. Thank you so much, Yemisi. I hope everyone can hear me and also. To see me clearly from this side. Yes, it broke for a second there, but yes, we can hear you. I'm going to share my screen now because I have your slides with me. So just bear with me just one second. I believe you can see the slides now. Yes, yes, I can. Thank you um, so much. So um, as you had already introduced me, my name is Andi Somatikengwa. I am a South African journalist that is based in Durban and I'm an associate at Oxpeckers Investigative Environmental Journalism. Uh, Oxpeckers is um, a pioneering woman-led platform um, or unit that solely focuses on env environmental reporting using data-driven journalism as well as geojournalism tools. And I'll be speaking about one of those tools today titled Wild Eye Southern Africa. So um, I'll be speaking about combating wildlife crime in Southern Africa, focusing on um, the data journalism project, which is titled Wild Eye. I'm also very happy uh, to note that um, the topic that we're trying to tackle with this tool is actually one of the key priority areas of the Africa Green Stimulus Program. So uh, I think this 
is the perfect platform or it was just the right or the perfect timing for everything. Um, can we please move on to the next slide? Thank you so much. So what is Wild Eye? Wild Eye is um, a project of Oxpeckers Investigative Environmental Journalism, which was launched in 2018. It's an open source mapping tool that provides public access to information on wildlife trafficking and other environmental crimes. We currently have four different versions of the tool, which are Wild Eye Global, Wild Eye Europe, Wild Eye Asia, and Wild Eye Southern Africa, which was recently launched. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So what is Wild Eye Southern Africa? Wild Eye Southern Africa um, was launched in November 2000, this year with the support of USAID's Southern Africa's Vuganao activity. Um, this platform or this project was built from the ground up by a group of data journalists with the assistance of our brilliant tech team. It's also a part of the Vuganao project, which is a project to build the capacity of data wranglers and investigative journalists to improve their impact towards um, significantly reducing poaching, as well as illegal trade in wildlife and to enhance law enforcement capacity. What the tool does is that it maps seizures, arrests, court cases, and convictions related to wildlife crimes. Next slide, please. So how can journalists make use of a platform such as WildEye? So they can use the platform to track specific data, patterns, or trends for use in the investigations. So they could investigate um, issues or topics such as comparing arrest and conviction rates between uh, different countries, or looking at where uh, law enforcement efforts are concentrated and whether these actually lead to judicial certainty. They can also use the platform to identify cases that they can build um, new stories on through court records or freedom of information requests. They can also use the data that we provide for investigative reporting and to expose criminal syndicates. Next slide, please. All right, so on this slide, I want us to focus on some of the challenges that uh, we came across uh, when working on our Wild Eye Southern Africa project, together with our data journalists or our data wranglers. So we found that uh, information and data on wildlife crimes is actually hard to find, and it's even harder to track over time and across borders. Uh, another issue that makes uh, it difficult is the lack of access to information laws that journalists can actually make use of to request information and data related to wildlife crimes, seizures, arrests, and convictions of criminal syndicates. We also realize that there's a lack of compliance uh, with access to information laws and processes by some state bodies. And uh, I mean, access to information is one of the key factors of um, obtaining the data that, uh, that informs this platform as uh, if we don't have the data, if we don't have the information on these um, crimes committed, the seizures, and also the progression of, of, of the arrests and the criminal cases, then we can't really have this map that maps all of this. Next slide, please. So um, with the project, we focused on building a community of practice. So um, what this community of practice uh, focused on is creating a platform or a community um, of journalists where uh, they have some sort of collaborative hub and um, are also open to opportunities and any kind of support when it comes to um, investigating wildlife crimes with the intention of uh, combating wildlife crime. Uh, so our footprint as wild eye um, uh, Southern Africa is spread out in Botswana, Namibia, Zim Zimbabwe, Malawi, South Africa, and Mozambique. We also have um, journalists in Asia and Europe with the rest of our wild eye platforms. So um, gender is an issue that we touched on um, a lot during the conference in most of the sessions that, that uh, I attended this week. So we definitely tried to bridge that gap of having newsrooms or having these collaborative hubs being um, 
mostly dominated by men. And as you can see uh, on the screen, this was our first group of uh, Southern Africa data wranglers or data journalists. And out of the five data wranglers, we actually had uh, three women from South Africa, Malawi and Mozambique who, contribute, who contributed to um, the development of this platform. Next slide, please. So um, uh, in our community of practice, uh, Wild Eye Southern Africa also provided training and professional support for these investigative journalists to improve their ability to report on wildlife crime. Uh, they also received mentorship from existing Oxpackers journalists that have worked on previous investigations for Oxpackers. The data wranglers also um, did professional tasks for action learning. And at the end of the program, they will be receiving these certificates that you see on the screen uh, to prove their participation and also thank them for their participation in the program. So uh, some of the tasks that they took part in was um, getting and collecting data for the platform. So we set data collection targets for them to collect data that would feed into the platform, which now maps all these um, wildlife crimes across the region. Uh, they also had to go back to their respective countries and try and use um, laws on access to information to obtain data that would feed into the Wild Eye platform. They also enrolled for the Ivuga Learn course, which is um, a course that provided professional support as well as tips and tools on how they can um, better report on wildlife crimes as journalists. And then they also did some data analysis and visualization of the data that they had collected. Uh, some of these journalists had not been exposed to data journalism previously. So this was a great um, way to learn on, on, on how to use data for their journalistic investigations and to also see how the data can actually be visualized in a, a way that's uh, very aesthetically pleasing and appealing and maps out all the crimes in the region. Next slide, please. So looking to the future of a platform such as Wild Eye Southern Africa and Wild Eye in its entirety, uh, we are hoping to expand Wild Eye's reach across the continent, not only the region, and also expand um, the community of Wild Eye journalists that contribute to the investigations, as well as the data that we have on the platform. We want to continue to build the community and the collaborative hub of these journalists. And for an organization such as UNEP, uh, support from them uh, would include um, them championing frame frameworks that strengthen access to information laws, and then supporting and offering skills trainings and workshops for journalists, such as data journalism and digital security. Uh, it would also be appreciated if they could offer legal services as well as assistance for journalists at risk, as we know that uh, environmental journalism is one of the riskiest um, beats in journalism and um, it would be really, really appreciated if there would be efforts to protect journalists, especially women journalists that go out into the field and put their lives at risk to, to expose um, such important stories. And then uh, another way that these efforts can be supported is offering financial support for new media initiatives for environmental reporting, such as data journalism, podcasting, and other initiatives that people um, will embark on. Uh, it would be also um, very beneficial to have them champion for equal pay issues and creating better support spaces for women environmental journalists in newsrooms. Next slide, please. All right, I'd like to thank uh, you, um, Yemisi, for the opportunity, as well as the African Women in Media Conference for this very um, great opportunity. And I'd like to invite all journalists that are joining us today to please um, email oxpeckers at oxpeckers at gmail.com uh, to find out more about enrolling for the Evoga Learn course, which I believe is not only beneficial for Southern African journalists, but also journalists in their respective country, countries across the continent on how they can actually start reporting on wildlife crimes, how they can access data and use that to expose wildlife crimes and criminal syndicates across the region and the continent. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Andy. Well, that was a really informative um, presentation. And it's great to see the work of Oxpeckers. Um, so congratulations to all of you on that. So now we have quite a number of questions. And I think <clears throat> while I give myself enough time, <clears throat> pardon me, to go through the questions, I'm going to ask my, my question first. Um, and it's really about impact. And I'll invite all our speakers to put their cameras on for this part of the discussion. So it's really about impact. I think all of you really central to everything that you, you've all said is around how do we have impact through our stories in relation to changing things around the environment. And I'm going to start with you, Amrita, in terms of this question, and particularly because you also spoke about impact for, from some of your stories. So how do you work with the people that with the journalists that work with you to ensure that there is an impact beyond the story. So do you, how do you work with them and what are your recommendations in terms of when we are thinking about a story right at the beginning, how do we kind of build impact into that story development? So if we can start with Amrita and then you can all then just maybe um, share your thoughts on it as well. Thanks, James. Um, you can hear me, right? Um, thanks for that question. It's interesting because I think there's no sort of one size fits all so much of whether impact happens or not, deter it's determined by, you know, external factors as well. But to the extent that we can sort of support it, I think one thing is to really encourage a solutions sort of focus uh, in reporting. So yes, we can, we can report on the, on the problem, on the issue. But what we can also do is speak to, you know, policymakers in our stories, speak to communities, um, and what would what would be the recommendations? What would be the suggestions? How would we make that happen? So sometimes that really helps, um, you know, bring about action because it's it's sort of clear, you know, what is the the way forward? What's missing? Um, I think that is something that as uh, mentors with grantees, um, we we try and sort of see if that can be teased out a little bit more. Um, I would say also it's, uh, you know, the outlet matters, uh, which outlet are you publishing in? Where is, you know, where's your story reaching? Um, how are we able to then promote that story to the audiences who need to, to, to see it, to drive change on the ground? That's also very relevant. Um, but I think, I think it's heartening that, you know, we can see that impact does happen. I mean, just, you know, look at all of the stories that were shared as examples today. Um, and, and it's, it's necessary for, for journalists. I think one of the key things that stayed with me was like sort of bringing something that might be a global issue, but really translating it to the local. How does it affect us here? And what can we do about it here? Um, in this district, in this town, in this country. Um, so that would be what I would say, yeah. Thank you very much, Amrita. Caroline, Madeline, and Diswad, what are your inputs to that question? Um, and Diswad, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I think from my side as a data journalist, I'd say that um, I think when we're working with data, or when people hear that you work with data, they focus mostly on the fact that it's just numbers, it's information, it's spreadsheets, sometimes PDFs, but uh, it's very important to go back to the ground and when you're perhaps analyzing the data, not just look at the numbers to see what they're saying and report simply on that, but to go back to the issues on the ground to see if they actually correlate with what's being reported by the numbers. Um, enhancing the voices of the people on the ground, using them as sources. I mean, we always say that data is another source, but at the end of the day, it's not going to speak to you and tell you that, okay, from um, the 20 rhinos pushed in this area, these have been the impacts. You need to be speaking to the people on the ground. You need to be hearing what's going on and how it affects them. So that is a very uh, important way of making sure that the stories that we write and the data that we mine actually um, does have impacts. Absolutely. And I'm going to come back to you with a question on data journalism in just a moment. But I want to hear from Caroline and Madeline. Um, Caroline, do you want to go first in terms of how we build impact into our stories? So I would say consistency. Consistency is key in reporting some of these stories. Consistency inspire policies because you keep hitting and hitting until they really feel there is need to, to work on this. 
uh, especially when you are story solution driven, it gives the solution, but it needs a lot of consistency. Most of these people need, these policy makers need a lot of reminders that this is happening and uh, this is what we think is good. This is what experts think should be done. Brilliant, thank you. And Madeline? I'll add that uh, we need to take us also in, into consideration the, dif the voice of different stakeholders. So in our story, does not focus on one particular people impacted by the problem, but having the voice of all the stakeholders involved in the problem. And after the story, make sure that we do a follow up like what happened after we published our story, those uh, communities condition have changed. Uh, do we have new policy to help those communities uh, handle the, the, the environmental issues? So uh, having those two options can be, can also help us to have impactful stories. Yeah, and that's great. And that's, that's all about measuring impact, right? So how do you measure impact though, Madeline? What are the what are the methods you use to measure the impact? Like you just said, going back to see, um, you know, what impact you Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will not say we have um, main uh, solutions to measure impact. What we usually do uh, in our media is to be in connection with uh, communities we are working with. If we have uh, indigenous communities like leader, like I was saying in my report, we make sure to stay connected to those indigenous communities to see what have changed after our, our report, what have changed after uh, the publication of the story. So this is the main issue we are looking at in terms of uh, measuring impacts, working with communities that are the main uh, people on our reports. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline, for that and to all of you for your contributions to that question. And so I'm going to come back to you to touch more on what you said about data journalism and ask you to talk to us more about the role of data journalism and data driven tools like Wild Eye and um, what role they play in really supporting the process to combating wildlife crime in the region. Um, thank you so much, uh, EMC. Uh, I think it was Carolyn who um, highlighted uh, the fact that um, these stories do have an impact if we're consistent in uh, working on these stories, they do have an impact on policy changes. So I think that's the importance of data. That's one of the important roles of data journalism uh, when reporting on uh, issues such as wildlife crime. Uh, from the data that we have, we're able to produce and track trends that are happening in specific areas and specific regions. So once we uh, write stories or investigations that actually highlight these trends in wildlife crimes, it inspires um, action on the part of law enforcement and they know exactly where to look. They know exactly what kind of trends to look out for. Uh, uh, it also exposes those uh, criminal syndicates. So um, by producing such data and exposing such trends, people are also able to track over time uh, how much um, the judicial systems, for instance, and law enforcement uh, are working hard to crack down on um, these uh, issues. Brilliant, thank you so much, and this well for that. I'm just looking at the comment, um, and I must apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name well. It's um, Osaru Namen, um, who says that as journalists who completely, who completely are oblivious of climate reporting, what resources or approaches would you suggest we focus on to enable us build capacity and interest in the field? So I think this is particularly around climate and reporting. Who would like to take that question first? Amrita, should we go to you? Um, so the question is, um, for somebody like um, this um, um, person commenting, um, who is oblivious of climate report, and what resources approach it, would you suggest the focus on in order to build capacity and interest in the field? Thank you. Um, so I will try my best to answer that question, because I think we all started out as journalists um, oblivious of climate reporting, right? Mm. So. So it sort of comes the more that you learn about it, the more that you read about it, the more that you speak to experts about it. Um, I think it's key as journalists that we try our best to understand the science. 
um, you know, it is daunting. Um, there are like thousand page reports and things like this. I, you know, but the point is, if we don't fully understand the science, um, you know, what is the difference between a 1.5 C versus two degrees kind of thing, then it's difficult to then convey that in an engaging way, in an interactive way that doesn't sound just sort of dry and copy pasted and things like this. So I think it's our job that right now, I would say every journalist um, essentially is, is a kind of climate reporter, right? Because it's affecting business, food, health, you know, environment, everything. And so if we can sort of try and do trainings, read, speak to sort of experts, you know, look at the IPCC um, resources. They have really great sort of media, media room sort of resources and tip sheets. Um, we, we can then sort of convey what we've learned and also sort of take that global understanding and, and kind of make it local as well. How does it affect us? Why should I care about it? I think that's, that's something that is important to build interest. Um, you know, a couple of degrees this way or that way doesn't sound like much unless you tell me, you know, I'm not going to be able to grow wheat in the growing season or, or something like this, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm going to lose the village that I grew up in because of sea level rise, something like this, I think, um, show what the stakes are for that local community, show how resilience is happening right now as we speak, that we're not just looking um, at policymakers for solutions, but what are communities doing? Um, in what ways are we already adapting? I think that is something that will help build interest as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I think it building on what you said about localizing the story um, and really understanding the science for ourselves before we are even able to communicate to the audience to really understand that it's not just about the policy actors, but us as, as individual um, actors ourselves in order to uh, make the change that we want. So, um, I want to ask Madeline specifically in terms of your platform, Info Congo, and how do environmental geo journalism platforms like um, Info Congo contribute to improving environmental news stories in Africa? Just to demonstrate the importance of having these kind of platforms. Um, Madeline, over to you. Thank you, Emsini. Um, in terms of um, uh, Info Congo, for, for our case, uh, we have been working in the region for about uh, six years, like I said, mm -hmm. and uh, it really changed the way um, journalists in the region cover environmental stories. First, we come with a new approach, uh, combining geojournalism and uh, field trip investigation, which is something really new in this region. Uh, we are not uh, many journalists in the region who use data to cover this scientific topic. So this is what something new and uh, really attractive for journalists from the, the, the perspective of data journalism. And uh, we start with trainings of journalists in the region uh, because it's a new topic, it's a new way to uh, work on journalism. And uh, we need to train journalists on this new topic and new ways to work. And uh, with those training, most or some of the journalists who have been trained in 2015 on geojournalism in Cameroon and DRC started uh, being specialized on environmental topic. Now we have many other outlets either that have uh, environmental pages or that are specialized on environmental news. We think in, in this region, we are not like uh, working alone on environmental topic, we need many journalists as possible to be involved on environmental topic, many outlets to be involved on environmental topic. And it's, it's what we are seeing this recent day. We can have case in Cameroon, we can have in, in DRC, we can have in Gabon, where we have network of journalists trying to organize themselves to share experience, to work on environmental topic. Because if you are alone, it will be difficult to work. If we are together, we'll be strong and we'll really inform about what is going on in terms of challenge and uh, solution that communities and uh, or authorities have for environmental challenges. So this is our contribution. And we think we have to do more. And uh, this type of opportunity of sharing experience and uh, also learning from others are really helpful to improve what we are doing uh, as media outlets. Thank you very much. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for that input. There is a question in the chat, which I'm going to ask in a moment. But first of all, I want to direct my next question to um, Mohammed and David from UNEP. Um, so you saw at the end of, um, and this was slide there, a list of ways in which UNEP might support journalism and um, particularly women journalists. So how would you respond to some of those um, areas? And what are some of the things you're, you are already doing to support journalists um, in covering the environmental issues on the continent? Thank you, Yamisi. Let me go first, and uh, maybe David also can, can step in. Um, look, I said we work with media as a partner. I think we need you to uh, amplify what we do and uh, explain the science that we package in a simple way for people to act. And this is very important. Uh, Amrita, you said, I mean, there are reports with hundred hundred and uh, pages. Yes, I agree with you. I used to be head of publishing and we produced those fat uh, 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 reports with a lot of scientific complex information. But try to build that network with experts because, um, you know, a chapter can be explained simply by an expert when you have that relationship and you get uh, insightful information and um, build that close collaboration with experts. This is very important in, in, in this profession. Um, of course, I mean, we engage with you uh, and we would, we, would, we would like to encourage this relationship and this engagement as partners. Because if you look at a, a UN uh, a, a document and especially project, when they are designed, the, the, the colon government communities, NGOs, and the media for the implementation of that project. So you are part of the implementation of that project. You are a key player when it comes to the implementation of that project. So get in from the design of that project, build that uh, relationship with, 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 uh, with experts and advise them how the should communicate on what they are doing. They really need your support and your, your expertise. And uh, um, uh, sometimes when I interact with colleagues, they are complaining about the resources and money. There is a lot of money out there for media, but we need professional media. We need media that can support what's going on and explain it in a simple way to engage those who uh, uh, need to, 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 to be part of the implementation of that project and those initiatives and move forward the, um, the, uh, uh, the environmental agenda in the continent. I saw a, a, a comment on private sector. Private sector is key for the implementation of, 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 of the environmental agenda in the world and in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Africa. We are actually uh, working on a platform called Science Policy Business Platform. And I'm pleased here to uh, announce that we will be launching next year the, uh, uh, the Africa chapter um, of this uh, platform. And this is where we bring to the table um, uh, key uh, players for moving to move this uh, environmental agenda. And remember, uh, the uh, role, the fundamental role of the UN is its, you know, convening power, its, its convening role to bring key players to the table to implement uh, a, a project and implement initiatives and support member states. Uh, David, probably you want, you want to add something here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Mohammed. Uh, maybe just a quick one, uh, and uh, I think Mohammed maybe should have mentioned this. Of course, is the the training element where you know uh, UNEP has in the past uh, worked with uh, a number of environmental journalists to offer some training in terms of um, sharing their available information and having different experts dealing with different uh, thematic areas uh, speak to the journalists. So. Uh, if you have experts, for example, on climate change, on water, on forestry, on chemicals, on waste management, they are able to, you know, have some discussions with the journalists in terms of what are the issues and then how do you, uh, you know, um, simplify some of these scientific uh, 
uh, you know, data uh, and make it, um, you know, uh, simple in a way that when it's reported, uh, you know, a common uh, person would understand what it means. So I think a, a training is a key element. And of course, um, building on to uh, what has been in existence for some time in terms of the network of environmental journalists, I think that's one other area that could really help. Uh, with this network where you have, um, you know, different journals from different countries coming together and they have their own network and they're able to share experiences and uh, lessons learned and some of the challenges and, you know, uh, see how these challenges can then be addressed uh, by organizations like UNEP and, uh, and, and the rest. And then, um, of course, building on what Mohamed has said in terms of working with the, uh, with the experts, because these reports are written by experts and they know what it means so if you know journalists are able to create time and work with these experts then they'll be able to understand uh, 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 in terms and make it easier to report because you cannot report on something that you you yourself do not understand in the first place so i think it's very critical that journalists create time to be able to interact with the experts learn from the experts be able to understand what some of this data and science means uh, to be able to to report and then finally i think uh, uh, it's something that also from the media side um, i know it's not easy but uh, you know environmental reporting i don't know uh, how much prominence it's given within media houses because take an example if you pick any uh, uh, newspaper on a daily basis uh, headline will be something on politics or, you know, whatever happened and, uh, or, or, you know, uh, some death somewhere or some, uh, you know, corruption cases somewhere. But you find issues related to environment are given a very small piece somewhere in the middle of, you know, a corner of the newspaper that, you know, so I think it's something that also, um, uh, as I said, I know it's not easy, but as we go along, maybe environmental journalists or journalists focusing on environmental reporting should try to uh, see how to create and get some more uh, airtime, if I may say, within the, um, you know, um, the newspapers or within the media houses to be able to uh, to report on some of this and, and also create some platform or spaces where different experts can be invited for interviews and, you know, that kind of, um, uh, you know, initiative where they can share some of their uh, information and experiences. So I think um, it's something that uh, can be built on gradually. But uh, again, as, um, as um, I think Caroline said, uh, it, it needs persistence. It needs something to keep on, you know, repeating the same thing to be able to uh, reach where we'd want to, 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 to be with regard to environmental reporting. Back to you. Thank you very much, David. And I was going to say, I'm Rita and so I know that you guys um, partner with media organizations for some of your projects. How do you find the prioritizing of your content in their, in their, um, in their you know, content, in their, in their publications? Is going to go first, and this one? Um, okay. Yes, um, I can. I can go first. Um, as I, as I said, we work with a number of of, of networks um, across the continent, and um, um, it, it, the the media in 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 the continent it's still struggling with uh, with with environmental issues because, as David said. There are other priorities that are really occupying the, the, the front page. And, and uh, but we need to find a smart strategy to streamline the environment in uh, uh, across the media. And uh, uh, because today the environment is not just about plant uh, trees, it's about energy, it's about food security. And when you touch, you need, when you write a story, you need to put the right ingredient there to influence in your media house to push that story to the top uh, uh, agenda of the media house. And also uh, um, write a story in a way that it can, uh, can attract you know, people to, 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 to interact with, with, with your story. And there are many cases there where you need, uh, you, 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 you can use 
um, from energy, from food security, for, from uh, uh, you know environmental degradation and and and, and migration. Um, you know the environment is at the at the root of 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 uh, is of 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 many issues that we are facing in the continent. So um, it's not just you know the surface. Um, we need to go deeper. We need to really uh, go deeper and support our stories with, um, you know, with with data. And and thank you and Siwa for mentioning that data is very important. Evidence is very important. That why we can attract and we can influence inside first uh, our media house to make sure that the environment is understood. Uh, the environment today has moved to the center of the debate. It's not in the periphery anymore. I mean, if you look at the international debate today and the global debate today, the environment is at the center because we start understanding and realizing that the environment is causing a lot of issues that are going to the surface. We have to go deeper to the root and fix that. So this is where really as as journalists, you need to focus and you need to uh, uh, to understand and get um, in you know extend your network through expert through UN organizations through other organizations really to support you to move uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And I want um, you guys to respond to that and to the question around prioritizing and particularly in, in relation to your partnerships with media, other media organizations that don't particularly have that niche focus on environment. And this is where do you want to go first? I'll go first. Thank you. So I, I think just building on what Mohammed has said, I think one of um, the right ingredients or the key ingredients for us as African journalists is um, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I think at every conference that I attend, I always hear this and I'll never get tired of hearing it because um, as African countries, we're definitely faced with similar issues when it comes to environmental issues or other beats that we um, report on. So um, first, before looking to outside organizations, uh, we need to look uh, within ourselves as African reporters. So um, we report on similar issues. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of momentum to build on as journalists reporting on these similar issues. So if we can first look within ourselves to find um, fellow journalists that we can work with to sort of like build impact and um, to also um, widen the reach of our stories, widen the reach of our issues, that would be the first key ingredient for us as journalists. And then uh, secondly, looking then to um, uh, outside organizations which have a global reach because um, yes, we do have the similar issues. Yes, we want to look within when reporting uh, on these issues, but then we need a bigger audience. We need uh, a, a bigger reach. So that's where uh, organizations come in. And uh, also, I mean, in terms of funding opportunities as well, because um, uh, with that global reach also comes uh, the need for funding for us to do the stories and to continue uh, reporting on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andiswa. I don't know if uh, Amrita, Madeline, Caroline, if you want to contribute to that question. Um, otherwise, we can move on to our audience question. So we've got Kristen Mitchell, who said, I would like more insights on the relationship between the private and environment or climate reporting. So that's private sector and environment and climate, climate reporting. This is because the private sector is a major stakeholder in policy making and because they are economy drivers. So what if in the process of boosting our economy, they pollute the environment? How do we as journalists ensure that we don't strike the wrong chords and end up risking both our lives and jobs when reporting on this issue? And I'd like to take that question to Caroline Madeline um, because I think one of you mentioned earlier on about the, the danger of um, environmental reporting. Um, so you know, how do you make sure that you are you are kind of reporting on the things that the, the private sector are doing to and needs to change in terms of environment without kind of risking your lives and your jobs as the questions asked. Madeline, would you like to take that one? Okay, I will try my best. <laughs> so um, I would say uh, environmental issue is not like a, uh, very simple topic when it comes to private sector 
and uh, sometimes when we report on this relation uh, or the impact of uh, private sector on environment or on, your com on communities, it's really dangerous for us. And uh, sometimes I've experimented uh, the situation where I go and fail to report on the impact of an agro-industrial plantation on communities uh, with uh, uh, information from NGOs and communities that we have case of pollution and uh, land degradation. And uh, we reach that community and security guards, uh, mm -hmm. gendarmes come and take us and say, "What? why are you coming here with cameras to make reports? Don't you know that we are in compound of this company and so on? But when we, we face this type of issue, first to, to, to prevent some harassment, uh, we do not go on fail without uh, informing uh, some member of the network of journalists in Cameroon that are like people that can react if you have a, if, if you face some trouble. So not being alone on investigating in this topic, uh, try to have people or networks of, it can be lawyers or journalists or international organizations that can support you when you face some trouble. Uh, also try to be like a professional journalist, not uh, just uh, stay, stay in your office and write story, go and fail. Try, make sure that you give also the possibility to the company to say something. Uh, you, you have the voice of community, but also the company who are um, the one pointing out that he's responsible of this thing, you have to make sure you get uh, their voices. If they don't accept to speak, it's okay, but you try your best to be to have a balanced story. This is how we try to handle it. Uh, and uh, for now, we have not been really arrested uh, because of our reports. We are trying to have balanced story in terms of environmental issue, but it's not always easy. It's very risky. Mm, absolutely. And um, we just got five minutes left before the end of the session. And I do want to let people out on time because we've got our speed networking session coming up next. Um, but Caroline, would you like to also respond to that question around safety and risk of reporting on the environment? And of course, and this one, I'm really very welcome to jump in at any point. Yes, uh, I think it's a it has been said it uh, report environmental especially investigative reporting has never been easy i'll give an, an a brief example when i was working on the story on, on african gray parrots getting the information was it is really hard and you have also to engage these people who traffic these birds across the borders but um, sometimes you have to go to 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 go to, to go incognito, to, be, to pose as a buyer and uh, not to really come out as yourself. For these people to share a lot of information, that is what I actually did. And uh, I got a lot of information because most of this information is usually online. This environment times they are online. You can always click, it is just a click away. So, uh, what I, I did in that case, I was posing as a buyer and uh, mo mo many of them would come to my inbox willing to offer, giving me information on how they are even bringing it to me. It was a very, it is a very delicate uh, conversation, but you should really know how to handle because even treating them also, you see, you are also endangering them, but you can always use a... Uh, you cannot never, sometimes you, you are forced to not to really reveal your source. You don't reveal your sources sometimes. Yes, they shared this very critical information, but it is the work of, like on my case, it was the work of the Kenya Wildlife Service, the government, to really track down these people. But you've, all, you've already shown them how easy to get these people. So sometimes it is, it is a very tough balance which you try to be self and also to show the the road that is really going on. Thank you so much, Caroline. <clears throat> and I'd like to say a big thank you to all our panelists um, today. We've had Andiswa Martin 
Antinka from Oxpeckers, Madeline Gunga, an editor and data journalist at Info Congo, and Rita Gupta, editor and content officer at Internews um, Health Earth Journalism Network, and also um, Caroline Shebet, who's a journalist with Standard Media in Kenya. And also with us was Mohamed Atani, who is the head of communication and outreach, and outreach at UNEP Africa, and David Ombisi, who is the program officer and coordinator at the AMCN um, Secretariat. So thank you all so much for joining us for what has been a, an impactful presentation around environmental journalism in Africa. We look forward to engaging with you and we will be sharing out more information about our partnership with UNEP on supporting environmental journalists in Africa.